Welcome to BPHL Fest 2020. My name is Amy Gallo and I'll be your If this is your first BPHL event or you've attended last year's inaugural festival, we're glad to have you here joining us celebrating innovation aligned with a purpose. Before I introduce our speakers, there are a few special notes. The cameras of attendees are not online so you can see the speakers, but they can't see you. There will be time for a short audience Q&A at the end, so if you have a question you would like to ask one of the speakers, simply type them into the chat function of this session at any time during the presentation. We have thousands of registered attendees from all around the world, and we will do our best to answer as many of the questions as time allows. If you lose internet connection during the session, please exit your browser and rejoin the session. Also make sure you're using Google Chrome where possible. Today's speakers will each talk about innovations in cancer born from personal experience. Please welcome me in joining Dana Donifrey from Anna Ono, Sue Weldon of Unite for Her, and Celine Kernaz of Massive Bio. Dana, we're gonna start with you. I have to tell you that I have that I own, I have used, and I love your products. So thank you so much and uh, tell us about Anna Ono. Thank you so much for bringing us here to BPHL. I think it's such an awesome opportunity to get to talk, um, not just about this space, but to also hear all of these other incredible presenters. So it really is an honor to be here. My name is Dana Donifrey. I'm the founder and CEO of Ana Ono. And Ana Ono is Intimates Designed Differently. We specialize in designing unique, uh, lingerie for those that have undergone breast surgery, often related to a cancer diagnosis. And what changes through a cancer diagnosis is a lot of different factors of a person's life, specifically breast cancer. Uh, one thing that is usually not expected is the changes that happen to your underwear drawer. I happen to know these changes intimately. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 27, a day before my 28th birthday and just two short months before my planned wedding. It completely changed my life. It flipped everything upside down. And when I heard those dreadful words on the phone talking back at me that I had breast cancer, my world went completely pitch black. This was 10 years ago. In 2010, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of breast cancer called HER2 positive. I look back at the 10 years of what I've experienced, both as a patient, but also as an advocate and activist in this arena. And to see the vast improvements that we have made in both medicine and treatment and care is, is really, truly incredible. And I like to think that um, a lot of the time, the patients are at the front of that innovation. And I believe that we think about innovation in many different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, innovation one is, I can say just briefly, um, in 2010, when I was diagnosed, there were barely 3 million breast cancer patients and survivors. Today, we're nearing 4 million breast cancer patients and survivors. I think a lot of this is attributed to furthering treatment options, providing more research and medicine to those that are specifically living with stage four metastatic breast cancer, the incurable, untreatable kind of breast cancer. And for those of us that have had very aggressive forms of breast cancer, but had very early intervention, so we still get to be alive here today. Um, all of this is a multifaceted approach to cancer in general. And Ana Ono plays a very, very small piece of that. I'm proud to say in 2010, when I went out shopping for what I thought was going to fit my new body and quickly found out that it was full of horrible, matronly, utilitarian, quote unquote, mastectomy bras, I'll also say grandma bras, I knew that something needed to change in this world. But what I realized that at, in 2010, nobody was talking about young women getting breast cancer. There was very, very little to be said about those of us that were getting diagnosed under the age of 40 or even premenopausal women with breast cancer. And the unfortunate side of that statistic is that our cancers were likely more aggressive and had uh, lower survival rates than those of the older women. I set out to change that because I felt like the world needed to see what breast cancer really looked like and not just to see fluffy pink tutus with pretty pink ribbons with women jumping and fighting and cheering into the air because um, I've now met many, many breast cancer patients and survivors. 
Uh, there's not a single one of us that jump up and down and celebrate our breast cancer diagnosis. So we have to remember this when we think about what the world does to market cancer and disease compared to what we actually feel when we're dealing and living with it on a daily basis. So I started on Ono because I wanted to feel beautiful in my new skin, in my new body, with my new story. And I wanted to feel like myself. I had lost so much of myself due to the cancer diagnosis. I had felt oftentimes like a lab rat in the middle of a medical system, just being one more person that got put into the oncology chair to get treated without really thinking about what is my life going to look like after my cancer diagnosis. And that's really where we step in because now that survivorship is such an important piece of your journey, an important piece of your life, it isn't just the doctor's office. We have to go out and live in the world. And in a lot of cases, that's with missing breasts, one breast, or new breasts. So it's something that we all need to grapple with and feel empowered about. And really what we set out to do with Ana Ono is to be completely boob inclusive. So everybody with every surgical outcome has something that's going to help them feel beautiful and feel confident and feel proud. We showed the world what breast cancer looked like at New York Fashion Week in 2017, at that point, there were no mastectomy scars on the internet. There weren't mastectomy bodies. People didn't even realize that these patients were having their breasts amputated from their bodies in effort to save their life. We showed that on a national platform. We went viral on New York Times with over 3 million hits in under 24 hours. And I knew the world was starving for the truth. And we set out to make sure that that was always the focus purpose and point of every project that we ever do. Last year at New York Fashion Week, we had 21 models living with stage four metastatic breast cancer. I told you earlier that the treatment options are very limited and it's uncurable. One in three breast cancer patients will metastasize. Our goal was to bring attention to that. Since last year, February, 2019, we've already lost over a third of those models. So what we do is we set out to fund metastatic breast cancer research to help those fight their fight because all we want is one more day with our loved ones. So we've raised over $350,000 for metastatic research uh, funded to Metaviver, which is an amazing organization that funds uh, stage four breast cancer research solely. And from there, we just really set out to truly make a difference in the lives of those living with the disease because we know we're not broken. We know we're no less of a woman. And we have to remember to all of our listeners out there, men get breast cancer too. And I will say that again, men get breast cancer too. So it's important that all of us do our monthly chest checks, stay diligent about your health, advocate for yourself. And we'll keep fighting and innovating and helping to make a difference in the lives of the cancer patients all around the world. because. We're fortunate to get to continue our life with our loved ones, and we want to feel the best that we can feel. So I really appreciate being here, sharing just a snippet of my story. And if there's anything that you have um, or anybody that you know is in need of this level of support, please send them to Ana Ono at A-N-A-O-N-O.com. And if you don't remember the name, think of me, Dana Donifrey, without the double Ds. See ya. Dana, thank you so much. I was just about to ask you the significance of the name. Um, and it's it's so perfect and um, so spunky with your personality. It's it's fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, next up is my dear friend, Sue Weldon. Um, Sue, please tell everybody about the work that you and Unite for Her does. And Dana, I just have to, you know, my arms are wrapped around you because because of that woman, I now have 12 bras in my in my drawers because I never used to wear them. A survivor as well. So my name's Sue Weldon, uh, founder and president of Unite for Her. And I feel like, you know, I want to introduce you to what Unite for Her is, um, what we do and uh, what it looked like for the past 10 years. And then what we looked like during COVID, because that was really such a shift that made us innovate quicker than we ever thought we were going to, all to make sure that we could serve our women newly diagnosed. For those of you who don't know Unite For Her, 
um, we bridge that gap between that medical and wellness community. We make sure that we enrich the lives of those affected by breast and ovarian cancer, and yes, men, as Dana said, that they get access to integrative care. We make sure that they can get acupuncture and yoga, massage therapy, nutrition, fresh organic vegetables, sexual health counseling, regular counseling, all of these integrative care um, modalities, they're not covered by the standard of care, right? And not always easy to get insurance covered. Unite for Her bridges that gap. $2,000 worth of treatments. We do wellness conferences in person. We do big fundraising events in person. We are known for our hands-on support and our COVID. Right, we treat about 15 to 1800 women and men newly diagnosed with breast and ovarian cancer a year. When COVID hit, you know, that was in March, we had about 800 more women that we were ready to, to treat. We were ready to bring our wellness program in person to them. We had to shift, right? And we knew we were going to be unwavering in that commitment. So, I'm actually going to pull up a PowerPoint right now because no one tells it better than the faces of our women. And when you look at this, you're gonna see, um, that's our innovative staff here, right? We all just had to shift and recreate how we delivered this program. How we did that was through her care box. You know, her care box was a part of Unite For Her's mission. We would send it anywhere across the nation. But what we didn't do is put the passport in there, right? Because we just could not manage that you know, nationwide. That vehicle was waiting for us. That became the tool that we ended up delivering that innovative, beautiful wellness day conference right to the safety of their home. Our women receive these beautiful gifts and they receive their care boxes and their vegetables so that they didn't have to step away or be worried about compromising their immune system or going outside during a time that was in crisis, right? I mean, all in crisis. Imagine having a diagnosis and then you put COVID on top of that. We knew we had to be committed. We were unwavering. We were not going to leave them. These are our women posting on social media. Social media became our platform. It became our, our um, digital you know, um, uh, airway that we would be able to then connect with our women to make sure that they were getting the care that they were in need of to help mitigate those side effects and symptoms because it was scientifically and research-based and now all of a sudden taken away in person. Enter the wellness day, right? We had to figure out how to do this virtually, similar to what we're all doing here today. But before I talk about that, this was the game changer. We also do all of our fundraising, right? So enter Bloom at Home, our staff creative. We knew we had to serve our women. We raised $2,000 worth of treatments for every one of those women. And what occurred is that our women, our models, just walked the runway at home. We had them live on Zoom. We went out to over 347 people joined us, but then all of a sudden we got a national partner and people could come in, 34 different states, 30,000 different hits, all watching them transcend through the screen. I look at those faces and I look at those loved ones that support them. That's hard to do when you're in a big room like we used to do with the big events. You could barely see the speaker sometime. This worked. This resonated, right? We knew that it was a home run for us to be able to deliver that hands-on support that we always did and that we were known for. So enter now the virtual wellness day. And that was a game changer for us. We knew that our women could feel us the way you feel us here today. We knew we could make a difference and tell them that we're going to bring your, you know, your um, oncology care right to your home, your social um, counseling and sexual health counseling. That will happen like this one on one. We'll cook with you with Aaron. We'll food shop with you and look in your refrigerator and then give you a gift card for $100. We used to do that in person everything started moving, right? Moving in a direction that we could do it digital. Our women were responding. Our community was responding, right? They could feel that we were delivering them that gift of care plus $2,000 worth of treatments. Our community came out, they rallied around us. We started just adding more and more to bridge those gaps that we knew that were important to deliver at a time when people were not leaving their home. This ended up being interesting because now all of a sudden 
when I went back here and we were talking about the wellness day and getting that passport and that education, we had women that normally wouldn't show up at a wellness day because they didn't have transportation. They were too sick to come out. They didn't have childcare. They had to work. Now, now this worked, right? So opportunity came and that was key for us. We knew that we had something special and that it could still transcend, you know, across this type of platform. So our community, they rallied around us and we continue to now do our fundraising virtually. We have no choice, right? We have to raise $2,000 worth of treatments for every single woman. We have our 5K coming up next week, right? So, but this is different. This year, we can be anywhere, right? And everywhere. You could walk, you can scooter, you can run. Everyone can unite for her. Where we used to treat 1,800 women in this area, and that's our focus this year, we now have a model that we can go and treat more women nationwide because we've created this platform, virtual platform, building them, our marketing manager, just building nonstop to make sure that our women have a safe place to land, a portal that they can meet our team, schedule their appointments and get the access that they need. And that, that was key, right? That was key. So for us to see that happen um, unexpectedly, you know, we planned on this, right? Like we planned on moving the model to get more women and to get the integrative therapies in the hands of more women, but it was going to take time. But through COVID, we actually had this opportunity to present that we didn't expect. And um, that opportunity allows us now to serve more women. So, um, and those women with metastatic disease, you know, Dana talked about them as well. We never leave their side. That passport, $2,000 worth of treatments every six months we renew it to make sure that they have access to the integrative care. If that oncology massage or acupuncture or Reiki or counseling is working, we do not want to take that away. So that is Unite for Her program 10 years, last six months. Different model, right? But same hands-on feel. And that was key, that our women could still feel us. You know, that same feeling of wrapping ourselves around them to support them when they could not even put, lift themselves up. That's Unite for Her, uniteforher.org. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Sue. I'm just checking to see if we have any other questions in here. Dana answered um, one question for someone who was newly diagnosed. Any, um, any advice? Sue, actually, I was gonna also pose that one to you. And then there are also some just very nice accolades of Unite for Her and the organization. Um, as well as the care boxes. Um, yeah, I, you have to forgive me, Amy. My AirPod ended up um, going out on me. So was there a question there that you needed? Um, so the, the question was actually originally posed to Dana that she did answer in the chat, but it was any advice to a newly diagnosed person, man or woman? Uh, yeah. So, you know, please reach out to UnitedFur.org. You know, the fact that it was always in the Philadelphia, New Jersey area, but now with the vehicle of her care box, we can actually get you that kind of healing virtually and get you resources that are so key to, you know, being able to give you that empowerment back and that control back at a time when um, you lose your confidence, right? When you're diagnosed and, and we all lost it. You know, I'm a 16 year survivor and I remember those days, but to be able to have something tangible to hold on to that you control, you know, that's key. That's key. So, you know, we can treat anyone across the nation now with this new model, which is beautiful. We're piloting. Um, but, you know, if you're in the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware area, just uniteforher.org, go to the info and, and we'll get you connected with our wellness program managing team. Um, Sue, one other question, and you touched upon this briefly, but how has your approach to your business um, changed during COVID? Oh, so, uh, my goodness, you know, like we we knew we had to treat these women, right? Like we weren't going to leave them. We, we were going to stay by their side. As a leader of this organization, I am I, I watch my staff and I want to keep them resilient because it's a lot right now. You know, it's a lot. And to make sure that we can continue to innovate and create that we can deliver so easily all of the different uh, modalities that we're known for. That's key. And to have a staff that continues to be resilient and creative to do that 
and then have that balance because we all know the work home balance is tough. You know, it's tough. Um, I know I, I, I just have to be that flexible, lead with empathy and know that our women are always first. And then how do we shift it to a place that's going to create um, opportunity for our women to get that type of healing while we go through this together? You know, and 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 um, I truly I truly believe that that is what's empowering all of us to keep moving forward. You know. Um, all right. I have another another comment here it says we are all more mindful than ever for the immuno immunosuppressed population. What could we do even post COVID? Um, that we can make life better for those fighting cancer or sustaining their sustaining their survivorship. Dana, so, can you take that or? What things can we keep doing that we're already focusing on now? So obviously we are, we're all masking up, we're all being socially distant, we're all, you know, and I, I, I think both of your messages thus far is empowering um, and trying to feel better and giving yourselves the tools to be able to to go out into the world and, and be strong and empowered. And that's messages that came from from both of you. So that I, I think anyone else wants to add anything. Yeah, I think something to remember is, um, and, and a dear friend of mine of uh, another cancer patient actually said this very early on in COVID. She said, doesn't it feel like the world just got cancer? And I thought that that was a really interesting thing to say because even us as cancer patients, we live in these bubbles for a huge portion of our life because our immune systems are suppressed. And I think that we have to be conscious of that, that the world is experiencing something that we've been through, through a lot of the, the phases of our life. And, you know, I, I really believe that making sure that you're still staying connected and you're keeping your mental space as clear as possible is a huge benefit to your overall lifestyle and, and healthy well-being. And I'm sure, Sue, you you probably have many tactical ways to do that, but I know staying positive is, is such a huge part of our life in general um, with and without COVID. Um, last, last question in the chat, and Sue, I think this one is also for you. Um, resources that Unite for Her would have for those who are BRCA positive that, that undergo preventive mastectomies? Yeah, so we, we actually do bring those into our, our, those cases into our programming. So, you know, we feel that you have to go through that surgery and you are BRCA positive. So you have to go through the side effects and the symptoms and the change that surgery comes with. It's a lot. You know, reconstruction is a lot. It's not something that um, we take lightly. And some of our women have, you know, different types of surgeries that they have to go through in order to just get to that end. And it, and it takes a couple months, you know, sometimes up to a year by the time they're feeling full and restored. So we're with them. We make sure that we give our whole entire program to those women that are BRCA positive as well. Same exact program. Yeah. Okay. Um, and truly, I think this is now the last one before that I, I move over to um, Celine. But uh, events that are coming up, Sue, how can people enroll? Oh, unite, uniteforher.org. The one that we have two coming up, we had to change everything. <laughs> we had to change everything. So we have our virtual 5K. I, I showed that a little bit at the end, and they can just get right on the website and it says go to distance for her. And just $30 registration, that is a, a donation to us. You could raise funds together for us, um, and you can walk right in your own hometown. And then we're actually shifting our, our chef and wine event. So that's gonna be our newest one um, where we're gonna be featuring, you know, different restaurants and wine tours and doing it virtual. Uh, we've had eight years of, you know, this beautiful event that people loved going to. So we're, we're gonna shift it, make it happen, you know, because we wanna make sure that we're still treating those 1800 women, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna have to leave anyone behind this year. So there are two that are coming up within the month, I wanna say, yeah. Great. Well, I will keep my eyes on the chat if anyone has other questions. Um, I will absolutely keep an eye on those and we can do those at the at the end. Um, but I do want to I want to introduce our third speaker. So last but absolutely not least, we're going to hear from Dr. Celine Kunaz. Um, your work is so incredibly interesting. I was doing Googling and I got lost in watching many videos of um, some of your interviews and you, the, your organization was also born from a personal experience. So if you could please tell us about Massive Bio. 
Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. This is Celine Cornaz. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Massive Bio. Uh, as Amy was was alluding to, my uh, story with cancer has started when my uncle has been diagnosed with cancer more than five years ago, and that was absolutely a devastating experience uh, for us in the family. Because what I learned about cancer is that until it hits the family, until it hits home, it is really not um, as real. Um, and it hit our family and my uh, parents and my family are not necessarily living into a place where it's been surrounded with large academic medical care center. As you would anticipate, we are not a billionaire either. So it was very, very, uh, I would say challenging uh, to really understand what actually the pharmaceutical companies are currently producing in the context of new drugs and new cares versus what the cancer patients are currently getting in the bedside. And there was a significant amount of disconnect right now. And 85% of the cancer patients are actually treated at the non-NCI designated cancer center. So they're basically treated at the community practices. So that's where my journey and Massive Bio's journey has started. You know, prior to Massive Bio, I was um, in a great job. You know, I had a great career. I was working extremely hard. And I had a very, very clear uh, trajectory in life, what I wanted to do in my career and in, in my personal life. However, when the cancer hit the family, that priority has completely shifted. And I was actually not necessarily knowing that this is going to be my life mission, uh, but that is how it actually happened. And I have completely, I would say, put my heart, soul, any kind of saving, my family's retirement saving, and everything that I can possibly do to really tackle one thing. And that thing is that there is thousands of clinical trials that the pharmaceutical companies are putting out there, even on a yearly basis. But we wanted to make sure that every cancer patient gets the opportunity to enroll to these clinical trials, regardless of where they are located or if they have the financial stability or not. Because the unfortunate nature is that if you think about the current process, in clinical trial enrollment, you know, a cancer patient goes to their uh, treating oncologist and 50% of the time the treating oncologist does not even discuss the option of a clinical trial with their patients. And then the remaining 50%, if they discuss the option with the clinical trials, majority of the time, the, clinic, the, the amount of clinical trials that they have in their own setting is already very limited. And they don't necessarily have all the resources in order to be able to mine the entire, I would say, clinical trial spectrum for them to identify the best clinical trials for this patient. And moreover, you know, 65% of the time when those patients are already at the treating oncologist's office, there is something happens, you know, there is something in their diagnostic level, their labs or something that makes them ineligible for the clinical trial. So you have made all this trip, you have made all this organization, you have worked all this hard, go to a physician and he ended up basically uh, deciding to working with you on a clinical trial and 65% of time you are not eligible for this. And with the, because the limited set of the clinical trials that the potentially that that physician has in their office. And we are in the 21st century. This is not something that should be the mainstream anymore. And that's where the massive bio component comes into consideration. Right now, what happens is that when a can if you're a cancer patient, you call massive bios patient contact center. And after you call massive bios patient contact center, you sign the consent and the HIPAA release. And then our medical record collectors go to your treating oncologist and we collect your medical records. And if you also have any kind of a diagnostic testing, we get that. And then we use our artificial intelligence based technology in order to be able to pre-screen you about 5,000 clinical trials that's currently recruiting in oncology in the United States and identify the clinical trial that works for your needs based on the specifications that you have. You know, if you want a, a clinical trial that's a 20 mile radius and what, what is the kind of the priority that you have. And then we work with you and your treating oncologist as well as the PI because 95% of the patients that come to our patient contact center are not treated in the large academic medical care center and they either have to be referred or 
if their uh, practice has enough patients that we also offer their practice to be a research site, which is what we call the just-in-time site activation so that the patient doesn't have to travel to a location. So basically, we provide that operational concierge after the glorified technology and the cutting edge technology does its, I would say, magic. And the, the, our clinical research uh, nurses uh, audits uh, that results from the technology, then we support on the operationalization. You know, if there's a referral that needs to happen, if there is a financial consideration that needs to happen because the patient doesn't have uh, the, the medium in order to go into that other location. There's a lot of different socioeconomic things that we have to, to do and in order to align the stars in order for that cancer patient to participate into that clinical trial. And then we basically help you in that entire patient enrollment journey so that you get access to a clinical trial and then someone is basically holding hands with you in a virtual way uh, in order to be able to, um, I would say, ensure that enrollment. And then we also continue following up with you after the uh, enrollment uh, to see how you're doing, if you're happy with it, uh, or if, if you wanted to look for a different change. So, and you are doing that, you know, especially in the first pre-screening level, without even going into any kind of a facility, we come to you, we try to bring you the technology because we would like the cancer patient to focus on uh, what is important uh, for them in their care, as opposed to spending time with the coordination, the logistics, and some of the minutiae of the science that they don't have the, the, the bandwidth to work with. So that's the current situation of massive bio. In the context of COVID, how the COVID, I would say, has helped or not helped uh, in our business is there is no question that the mobility of the cancer patients has reduced, which has reduced the enrollment rate. Although in oncology, the amount of impact that has been received is less than some other disease types, but still the enrollment rate has reduced. On the other hand, on the business side, there is a significant amount of uptake that we have observed because if about 65 to 67 percent of the clinical trials were late prior to COVID, right now 100 percent of the clinical trials are late. And because of that reason, the pharmaceutical companies start to adapt the digital technologies where they were thinking it's more like a nice to have uh, before. Uh, it's right now been nice to have, um, it's a must have so that we, they started to implement that and we have been receiving significant amount of demand uh, from all uh, different sizes and variations of pharmaceutical companies to support them to identify, uh, prescreen the, the patients and then provide that concierge level enrollment support so that the patients doesn't get disadvantaged because of their location or anything on the financial matters. So, COVID overall, I think, although it has a lot of significant challenges that brought to everyone's life, everyone's family, some families has been impacted more deadly than the others, but I would like to use this as an opportunity for the adaptation of clinical innovation at a rapid scale, which cannot happen without a drastic event uh, like this one. And at Massive Bio, we are super passionate to bring the, the opportunity for every cancer patient. You know, uh, although we are a profit-based organization, you know, the amount of work that we do and the amount of, I would say, support that we provide, because we provide a clinical trial enrollment services to cancer patients for free. So we uh, provide the everything that we can possibly do to, uh, I would say, support the cancer patients while we are trying to keep the lights running with the support from the pharmaceutical companies like every other organization. So we believe that we sit at the intersection of technology services, as well as oncology subspecialist expertise, and we put our heart, soul, money, and everything that we can possibly do to change the nature of the cancer care 
in the United States and potentially around the globe. And that's why we are here. You know, anyone who wants to be a part of our journey, our doors are always open. We, our website is http www.massivebuy.com. And I also have some team members that are in here. And we are here for you to change this nature of the challenges in the healthcare, especially in the context of oncology clinical trial enrollment. Um, what would you tell a patient who's nervous about participating in a clinical trial that they may qualify for? Well, it's a matter of why they are nervous about it. Are they nervous about the science or are they nervous about in the context of the operational things, the, I would say, the, the logistics things, the travel and all the others? If they are nervous about the operational things, that's what we are here for in order to be able to support them in the journey. On the clinical side, if they're nervous about, there are two things that I can tell. One of them is that, you know, it takes sometimes about 15 years in order to develop an oncology drug. And we all know that the time is extremely important for a cancer patient. You know, this a clinical trial maybe potentially give them the opportunity to get access to a cutting edge treatment that they have to wait maybe some years in order to get that. And that buys time for them. And then the second thing that I would I would provide to them is that right now in the current clinical trial setting, the worst case scenario that is they get standard of care. You know, they're not necessarily getting, uh, I would say, a placebo or anything like the, the nature of the clinical trials and the clinical trials uh, designs have changed drastically. You know, what would be the worst case? You get the standard of care. What would be the best case? You get a treatment that you may potentially going to be eligible for X years down the road and you get that early and you have the opportunity to, I would say, digest that treatment and potentially change the course of your life. You know, I think at this point in time, there's really little to lose, but this has to be very carefully communicated with the treating uh, physician and with all the organizations around the patient so that everything should be transparent. Here in the Philadelphia area, we are truly blessed with um, the medical system that we have access to and available to us. And from what I read from Massive Bio, you know, one of the big things that you were trying to do was, was bridge a gap in access and geography. So can you talk a little bit about um, how your work has enabled those who did not have access to um, this type of care? Yeah, so there are at least two or three ways that we provide that uh, I would say support. One way is that since we are a digitally enabled platform, the patient doesn't have to go to a treating oncologist or any kind of a physician to get an idea if they will be qualified for a clinical trial. So you can be in Wyoming, you can be in anywhere you know, in, a, in any remote location, uh, if you want it to be considered for a clinical trial. So let us do the work for you. And if you are qualified to a trial, then you have to travel. So that's kind of one major area that we are resolving in the front end. The second area that we are doing is that, you know, if we also look at the totality of your treating oncologist. And if that treating oncologist has like similar patients like you that will war uh, warrant for a site opening, we do a just-in-time site activation so that your site become a research site and you become a part of that, that research site um, uh, uh, in, in your treatment journey. So that's the other area that we, we try to help and we try to increase the clinical research savviness of the current uh, provider or the physician that you're working so that you don't have to necessarily travel. Of course, that's not like a instantaneous process. There are certain weeks that it takes in order to be able to get that just-in-time activation, but we also do that. And then the third thing, if everything fails, we try to resolve the operational issues. For example, we look at your insurance status, and if you are going to be referred to another, um, I would say, treating oncologist, we have to check if the PI or the refer, uh, referred provider is accepting your insurance and what kind of potential out-of-pocket cost that you need to incur by making that jump from your current provider 
to the PI that's conducting that. So there are, I would say, the leverage of the technology from a quote unquote, the clinical standpoint in order to be able to give you the opportunity to give you the cheat sheet with the lack of better words before you make that move. And then after you decide to make the move, you're trying to navigate in such a way that this is smart move so that you don't have to travel. Or even if you travel, you don't get into an out of pocket cost that you were not anticipating that you were going to go through at the beginning. Have you seen um, patterns around what types of um, cancer patients, you know, the types of cancer that, that come to you? Yeah. Are there specific? So obviously we have a lot of breast cancer folks here on the call, but. Yeah. Um, yes, we have a little bit of a bipolarism on that one. You know, we have two spectrum of cancer patients that typically comes to us. One of them is the high volume cancers, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, some versions of pancreatic cancer, and that's a volume game. And then the other aspect of the cancer patients that come to us is that rare cancers, because they're not necessarily looking the, or, or finding the opportunity to find a subspecialist in their own setting in order to be able to help them. You're either a volume game or a rare game. So you are typically working in that spectrum, but a significant portion of the cancer patients that comes to Massabio are coming from cancer centers that are not NCI designated. You know, those are not large academic medical cancer centers. We, of course, appreciate the opportunity if you're treated in the largest cancer center in the world to come to us. We appreciate that, but we appreciate more if you are coming to us from a cancer center that does not necessarily have the fairly significant number of clinical trials, fairly significant amount of support, so that we can be that support to you so that you basically focus on your care. a question to Dana. What um, what plans and what new things are on the horizon for you in 2021 and beyond? Wow, what a great question. I know. Um, really. Uh, nice and open-ended. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, for, for us, I think that the, the, the land to treat these patients in is such a whiteboard. We know we have a lot of work um, in the survivorship level of the community, as well as in the outreach. Uh, we've been shipping our bras around the world, um, from Honduras to Japan, uh, to Switzerland and New Zealand. And I just feel like there's so much work to be done around the world. These women around the world are sharing their breast cancer stories with us, um, telling us about their hardships and their limited access to both treatment and lifestyle needs. And I can only dream as big to say that every woman diagnosed will know that we are there to support them and, and lend a helping hand and continue to just, you know, try to ease the pain of the surgery recovery treatment as much as we possibly can. So I'm excited to continue to grow and to support the community, uh, both through our amazing bras and underwear and loungewear, but also um, by supporting amazing organizations like Unite For Her. Uh, we love them very, very much. And, and two, at clinical trials with research. Um, it's what we raise our money for every year so we can all get one more day um, here with our loved ones. So uh, we'll keep fighting the good fight. And Dana, I saw your comment in the chat about um, how grateful you are for the people who came before you and I in the clinical trials for HER2 um, breast cancer. So. Um, I also share that same feeling of gratitude uh, and, you know, just wanted to kind of leave, leave it open for last comments from any of our speakers, Sue, if there's anything that you want to touch on um, as I'm just want monitoring chat and making sure we're getting to everybody's questions. We have the 5K next week and plans going on for 2021 for Unite For Her? Yeah, yeah. So so I feel truly that, you know, we ended up getting this opportunity to serve more women and it got put in front of us and we had the vehicle to do that through the Her Care Box. So we are looking forward to seeing that model come to fruition. Um, something that was piloted even at Independence Blue Cross, you know, as early as a year, two years ago, where we were sending these care boxes out to members now all of a sudden the, the care box is becoming the vehicle in which we can ship this full integrated program. 
that's exciting. That means that there's no barriers that way, that we can then expand to other areas around the nation. So um, so we're looking forward to seeing how that all you know pans out. Uh, clearly, we have a lot of funding that we have to raise in order to make that happen. But we also see hospital partners and corporations partnering with us to do good in their community and to serve where it's needed. Um, I think there was a couple questions in the chat about you know uh, when the chef event is and the 5K. That's all on our website and clearly at uniteforher.org um, or the Unite for Her Facebook and Instagram. You know that's. Everything's everything's virtual and digital now, right? So we, we have to embrace it and figure out the best way that our women can get access to that. Great. Um, and Celine, any comments about the future for Massive Bio moving into the next, you know, uh, you're on such the cutting edge and, and such amazing, powerful work, but what is next on your plate or what big projects and challenges are you um, gearing up for? Yeah, 2021 is going to be definitely a very exciting year for us. We are almost building the version 2.0 uh, of Massive Bio in 2021. Uh, and of course, COVID has um, helped tremendously. As I mentioned, we became a nice to have to, to an absolute mass staff for the pharmaceutical companies. And while we are doing that, we are also giving a significant emphasis on the uh, customer delivery, which we think that is significantly missing in the clinical research um, industry. So that there's a professional services level of support that both the patients as well as the pharmaceutical companies get. We are also uh, in process of, uh, I would say, launching our new real world data and analytics program that would also enable to have more knowledge uh, and understanding of the clinical trial enrollment journey. Uh, and we are, uh, in, in order to be able to accommodate that growth and scale, um, we are also finalizing our next layer of financing. But what I can tell you, uh, I think, for the cancer patients is that you will be surprised the amount of resources and even the free resources available out there. You know, I would really recommend the cancer patients to look for those resources and don't feel them alone. Uh, okay, because you know, like we always, when we get in the, the cancer hits the family, we think that we are alone, but you are not alone. You know, like there is a a family, at least your massive bio family is there for you, you know, in order to be able to help you to, uh, I would say, get through this monumental challenges, you know, both clinical, financial and the operational challenges. So just look for it. And, you know, we are as an organization committed to support in any form and shape. You know, we basically end up finding ourselves uh, basically worrying about the electricity bill of, of a patient, you know, like for something that is not necessarily core on a day-to-day -day basis, but deeply, I would say, impacts our, um, uh, I would say, challenges because, you know, the, all the socioeconomic conditions, all the other things also has to be aligned in order for those patients to participate into clinical trials. You know, uh, happy to help you in any form and shape with our team and happy to find you any organization that can potentially help you for the areas of interest that's important for you, you know, don't feel alone. Um, this is not a journey that you have to, to do by yourself. Just involve sharing is caring. And um, we absolutely want it to be in your journey with the others uh, because this is a kind of an area, I think the cancer care, you have to really give your life um, and for people like us in order to create a change. And we are very serious. There's no way to give up until the last patient gets to the clinical trial that they deserve. As, as we are wrapping up this session, and even in this virtual environment, the, the passion and dedication and compassion that each of you have is, is, is palpable. And it, it is, it's really amazing to, to, to hear all of this and, and to feel it through the screen, which is Amazing. As as we were we were talking, you know, before we went we, we went on live and we were saying how, you know, we just wish that we could all be together and, and physically be in, you know, whether it's the Blue Cross Innovation Session or center or wherever, you know, physically together. I think this was probably the closest as, as we could get. And each of you were truly, truly inspiring. Um so th uh, this is truly all you know. This is all the time that we have for today. Thank you, Dana, Sue, Celine, for your inspiring innovation. 
I mean, for everything that you are doing for cancer patients. It is truly, truly powerful and meaningful work. Um, and thank you also to our audience for participating, all of your questions. Um, I believe that we hit everything in the chat. I know the speakers are also addressing some as well. Um, everyone gave their websites. Um, thank you so much um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, Amy, for having us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Amy. You. We all learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Amy.